Hello and welcome to Murder Dictionary Podcast. My name is Brianna and that is Courtney. Hello. So before we get started, we always want to remind you to check out our description and show notes every week because we will have links to our social media if you want to follow us there. We will have links to some resources that we use for research if you want to read. Buckle up because Metro is bringing you the best deal in wireless. Switch to Metro and get your choice of two awesome free phones from top brands like Samsung and LG with huge HD screens and tons of memory for all your pics and videos. So hurry into Metro and get your awesome free phones only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. Requires port and of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. Limit four per account or household. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions. ...up a little bit more about the case, and we often put links to videos and documentaries, and you will find links to some resources for mental health and anti-bullying, suicide prevention, all sorts of stuff, if you want to get some links for that. You will also find links to our Patreon and our Threadless. On Threadless, you can get merch like t-shirts and mugs and phone cases. So if you want to get some Murder Dictionary merch, check out Threadless and the link will be in the show notes. If you want to get some smaller items or some access to bonus episodes, then you can check out our Patreon. So this week, we have a few new supporters on Patreon. So we wanted to say thank you to Heath, Laura, and Marsha increased her pledge. So thanks, you guys. Thank you. So with all that said, I think that we can get to our story, which is we're still on D for Dirty Cops. And I'm really loving these episodes. It's going to be really hard for me to move past D. Yeah. Right? I mean, the trust issues. I couldn't wait to get off bikers. Yeah, I was just ready to move on, you know. But now that we're on D, I'm really digging it. I thought this was pretty fun. Yeah. Dirty Cops was good. Yes. I'm sure. It's much it's much more interesting than dentists. <laughs> but you can't have everything. Yes, I, guess. I win. No. no, you totally won. And I mean, once you start digging into Dirty Cops, you just start questioning everything you've ever known. It's crazy. It really is. Yeah, I think that this is a particularly good subject to explore. But we're definitely in the midst of trying to find some dentists so we can do a Patreon bonus. I found one. Okay, we're definitely going to do a Patreon bonus then. I see the look on your face and I'm like, yeah, yep, that's the case. It's actually like a real heavy hitter because it's two dentists what? married to each other. Okay. And they have their own practice. I mean, that's just great, right? <laughs> that covered all the bases. I was like, I'm going to find a... D-. No, I found two and they're married and they own their own business. More bang for your dentist buck. Right. So definitely join Patreon (laughs) for your banging dentist. We're going to try and figure that out and get an episode on Patreon about dentists. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So this week, D for Dirty Cops, we are going to talk about Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa. So Louis Eppolito was born in Brooklyn, New York on July 22nd, 1948. And most people didn't call him by his full name. They called him Louis or Lou. His mother, Tessie, was a registered nurse, and his father was a Gambino crime family associate named Ralph Fats the Gangster Eppolito. I like that nickname. We've got so many good nicknames in the past few weeks. It's really great. At least this one isn't racist. It's so much better than some of the other ones we're coming across. Yeah. So Ralph Eppolito was a bookie and he ran illegal gambling out of the back of the bar, from what I understand. Surprise, surprise. You know, it's a good setup. Louis's grandfather was Diamond Lou, who was the jeweler for mob boss Lucky Luciano. I want to be Diamond Lou. I mean... Of all the names, that's a great one. So far, that's the one I want. I feel like he's got to have a special suit or something. Like we were just talking about Elton John. He's got to have like a whole Elton John get up if you're Diamond Lou. Sparkle. Yes. Got to sparkle. So one of the things that Diamond Lou was known for was he was the person that when someone became a made man, Diamond Lou made you a watch. That was his claim to fame. So people would walk around and they were like, oh, I've got a Diamond Lou watch. And you know... This is a made man. Oh, that's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. So Louis' uncle James and his cousin James Jr. were also members of the Gambino family until the Gambino family boss, Paul Castellano, ordered a hit on them to be murdered by hitman Roy DeMeo. These are all familiar mob names, right? Yeah. We've all heard these. Yeah. 
So when Louis was in his teens, he got rheumatic fever and he actually almost lost his life. But when he recovered, he became completely obsessed with health and fitness and he started bodybuilding. So it seemed like after his health scare, he was just like, I have to be the most healthiest I can possibly be. Never want to go through that again. Yes, exactly. It scared the crap out of him, completely changed his life. So once he got on this big health kick, he began entering bodybuilding competitions. And eventually, he actually won Mr. New York City in 1967. So he did pretty well. He married his high school sweetheart, and they had a son named Lou Jr., of course. I feel like these types of people, you see this is headed to dangerous territory when you've got a junior, Right. All the juniors. The ego involved in that. All the juniors that you can have are all living here. (laughs) But they divorced after only two years together. And a short time later, he remarried a woman named Frances. The two of them had three children together. Andrea, Diana, and Tony. From what I understand, Lou was kind of a smooth talker. He was always approaching girls all the time. The way he met his second wife was that he was on vacation somewhere. I want to say it was like Costa Rica or something. And there was this woman getting off of an elevator and he just went up to her and he's like, please tell me you live in New York. And she said, yes, I do. Why? And he said, because I I really want to take you out or something like that. I saw that. Yeah. I forgot all about that. That's right. And I've read, like, I'm including that because I've read plenty of accounts that he was pretty much a gnarly womanizer. Yeah. Yeah. And he got around town, he even when he was married. He was just a gift. <laughs> like, he was clearly. God's gift to women. Yeah. That's how he saw and himself. And from what he says to her, you know, I mean, she didn't marry him, though, but. I mean, it worked. What are you going to do? It's a numbers game. I think it was. Was it Puerto Rico or was it Costa Rica? Uh, yeah, I don't remember. But yeah, they were both on vacation. I don't know. It was a vacation. But yeah. um, yeah. But then you have to think, how many women did he walk up to and say that same line that were just like, this fool? Are you serious? This is Get a numbers game. Face. This is a numbers game. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so soon after his second marriage, when his kids were still really young, his father died in his sleep of a heart attack. And of course, at the funeral, there were many mobsters in attendance, and a lot of them came up to Lou and they offered him work. They offered to help his family out, you know, as one does. So at 20 years old in 1969, Lou took the test to be an officer in the NYPD. And it seems like he really only had the guts to do so after his father had passed, because of course, in his mob family, they were very against police. And it seemed like once he was gone, he's like, okay, I can be a cop now because dad won't be mad at me. Yeah, I think it's weird that he even agrees, you know, or wants to or pursues the police in any real way because he was not raised to respect or care or want to have anything to do with police or law enforcement. Yes, it does seem highly unusual. But here's the thing that I heard about it. The reason that he actually even took the test was because through his bodybuilding at the gym, one of his friends was training for the LAPD or the NYPD test. So he was helping him work out and do all the whatever criteria that they ask for. And he was like, oh, well, we've all worked out together. Let me just take the test, too. It was purely by accident. I don't know if he just kind of wanted to test himself and see what he could do or whatever. That's what it seemed like when I I completely I don't know what happened to me, but everything that I read, saw, I just I've forgotten everything I've ever known. (laughs) But I do remember that now that, yeah, it was like completely by chance. He was just like, I want to see if I can pass it. Right. Just to see. Right. Just as a test. And then once they said, oh, yeah, you passed it. He was like, oh, wait, now I can seriously consider this. This is an option now. And my dad is gone. The other family members have been murdered. So, yeah, I don't really have anyone telling me not to be in the NYPD. I don't want to call it, but it is. It's a crime of opportunity, if you will. It really is. Like This is just an opportunity and it just happened to come up to him. And if it had been trash man. Cool. I think he would have gone with it. It reminds me kind of very loosely of The Departed, 
You know what I mean? Like he could have gone through a couple yeah. different paths, but he was like, I can kind of be a bad guy in good guy clothing. I have this opportunity. Definitely. So he chose that one and he joined the NYPD. Normally, the NYPD background check would uncover that this candidate had mob ties and it would lead to him being disqualified under any normal circumstances. But of course, at this time, there were so many men fighting in Vietnam that the NYPD really needed people. And Louis got accepted because of their desperation, pretty much. That's pretty insane. Yeah. The standards were way low. Yeah. They're like, hey, we know you might be a mobster, but. And we're cool with it. When can, can you start? Can you shoot a gun? When can you start? Right. Can you drive? <laughs> <laughs> you can't drive? Okay. Can you ride a bike? We'll put you on a horse. Okay. Can you walk and spin this billy club? There you go. He did really well early on in his career, and he quickly got promoted to detective in 1977. In 1979, Lou was moved to the robbery unit, and he was assigned to a new partner named Stephen Caracapa, who seemed to be basically the opposite of Lou in every way. Stephen was very quiet and calculated while Louis was just loud and aggressive, and everyone said he was constantly seeking a lot of attention, he was just that guy, you know? Stephen was very tall, he was lanky, and he was well put together, while Lou was short and stocky, and he always looked a little bit more disheveled and maybe casual, to be nice about it, you know? This is uh, in the movie version that we were robbed of. It really makes me sad when I think about it. The opportunity. What a great film. It would have been David Spade and Chris Farley. Yes. Playing Stephen Carecap and Louis Aplito. If this was a buddy cop comedy, yeah. that would totally be them. And I was saying it earlier that like this could have been Chris Farley's like first little bit of a dramatic turn. He could have right? shown us another side of him. David Spade, too. They could have had like a real could have been a funny movie. But oh, my God, it, it, this could be so good. Like I could write it. Yeah, if you, you can know? picture that in your head, that's yeah. exactly what Lou and Steven were. Yeah, like that's a, it was funny because I was like, that is the perfect description of these two. It's it, like Tommy Boy, Black Sheep. Yes, absolutely exactly. them. But they made really great partners as opposites. You know, Steven had the brains, he had the stealth, he was calculated, and Lou had the muscle. He was intimidating. He knew how to like get in people's faces and he wasn't afraid to do so. Stephen was born in 1941 to a working class family in Staten Island, and he was raised in an Italian neighborhood, very similar to Lou. His family struggled a lot financially when he was growing up, and he actually had to drop out of high school because he had to start working in construction in order to help his family make ends meet. When he got tired of working so hard for such low wages, he decided to rob a truck with a friend and try and make some easy money really quick. It's an interesting thing to jump to. Right. But, like, okay. There's a lot of side hustles, right? All right. We're Why robbing you go this drive truck for now. Uber or something. Right? Like, geez, <laughs> you got options, don't you? No, I mean, I think that it's just like most likely they were taking these young kids and giving them the most physically strenuous jobs. And he just got burnt out. But there's so many other options that you could try to explore before completely jumping to like, yeah, let me just do fel felony burglary, you know? Yeah, I think they're just surrounded by this. This is like normal to them and they don't have options except for criminal ones is like the way that it's put yeah. in their head. I think that there must have been so many influences around him where yeah. he saw people getting away with it that it didn't seem like that big of a deal. Because yeah. to you and I, that seems completely foreign. But for, in order for someone to consider that, it had to be not a foreign concept to them. Well, it's like people that, you know, find loopholes onto things and it's like, well, other people do it. Why can't I? Right. You know, it's a little bit of entitlement. Yeah. He's like, oh, everybody's stealing. I could steal. There, that's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> you got it. So, of course... The robbery didn't go over well. Oh, surprise. A bunch yeah. of kids are trying to knock off a truck. Right. These teenagers. What? Like, of course, it didn't work out. And he was arrested for grand larceny. But, of course, he was so young that he only got probation for the crime. In 1966, Stephen joined the army and he went to Vietnam. 
When he came back, he applied to be in the NYPD. He did, of course, have this felony arrest, but it was as a juvenile, which, of course, it almost disqualified him. But again, like I said before, since so many people were currently fighting in Vietnam, they had lowered their standards. So NYPD was desperate for help and Steve was hired. They both got in on desperation, similar situations. They wouldn't normally be even on the NYPD. This is not the A squad. No, no. It's probably not even B or C at this point. I was going to say this is like C squad at best. Yeah. So Stephen and Lou were only partners for about a year before Lou was sent to the homicide squad. But they remained extremely close friends, even though they weren't partners anymore. Louis received several commendations for bravery, and he was inducted into the very prestigious Honor Society. So he was doing pretty well. His career was taking off. He seemingly was one of the good guys at this point. In the 80s, Louis's clean record began to unravel, starting with a 1984 suspension without pay for six months because he was accused of divulging confidential information to members of organized crime. Don't you just let them go? You don't just suspend them. I mean, they're giving information to organized crime. Yeah. You know, that seems like a... It seems very straightforward, but... Yeah, but they need people so badly, they can't just, yeah, they can't just cut them out. And on top of that, I think that they have to do a trial. Like, even if there's evidence, they have to treat them like anyone else and give them like, okay, you're accused of this, try and defend yourself. Got it. So that's where it went. Basically, they had this evidence because an NYPD raid led to the discovery of confidential police documents in the home of a heroin dealer named Rosario Gambino. The documents were dusted for prints and they were matched to Lou Eppolito. The NYPD gave him the choice to either resign or fight the charges in court. And it was clear that they planned to make an example out of him. Because I think this was happening a little bit. It wasn't just Lou and Steven. I think there was a bunch of cops doing this and they were cracking down. Lou chose to fight the charges. And in 1985, a court found him not guilty. That's crazy because he's got his fingerprints on it. But they could just say like, oh, it fell out of his briefcase. Well, what I had heard was that the judge thought that the fingerprints looked like they were a photocopy. I don't know how that happened because (laughs) fingerprint dusting is fingerprint dusting. You just cleared something up for me, though, because I heard that same thing. And it's funny because I was like, oh, I misheard that. Right. That doesn't seem right. It doesn't make sense to me. There's no way that makes sense. So now you're confirming that, no, that's what I heard. And that, yeah, I'm what? You cannot physically photocopy something on to get only to show up by fingerprint dusting and he's it's either ink or not, not guilty right? like, either way like go. not guilty so i don't know if there was still some sort of desperation where they're like oh we just get people as many people on the force you know we got to crack he down is on a the detective streets. with really good record too so they may have possible. been lenient at this point i mean he's got a pretty good record yeah Everyone is corrupt in the NYPD. So if he's not, you know, doing crazy shit, he's considered probably like a straight arrow. Yeah, I think in the mid 80s, if you have the kind of awards that he had, maybe they just decided, okay, he fucked up. We'll just let him off because he learned his lesson. Probably. Clearly not, though. No. Or otherwise he wouldn't be on Murder Dictionary. That's correct. (laughs) But of course, even though he was found not guilty, the truth was Lou was indeed selling confidential information to the mob. And I don't really have a date on when it started, but he had been doing it for a while when he got caught. It it always started. Like it was just always. Yeah. Just when? Always. It may have been from day one. We really don't have a record of the first time that he had given information what you hear when you listen and look into this uh, it seems like it's just always been that way yeah it does when people talk about it seem like it's a given that lou was always a corrupt cop yes even if he was getting awards lou was also still secretly partnered with his friend steven back from the robbery division and they were actually using knowledge from their two separate divisions to sell to various crime families So now, instead of them both being partnered 
in the NYPD in one unit, they had knowledge from two different ones. So this meant more money for them. So smart. And so they had been working together the whole time. After winning the case, Lou was reinstated as detective. And soon after, he was actually promoted. Yeah, they don't have a problem with Lou at all. Don't care. They're just, yeah, whatever, Lou. As long as you get things done, I feel like. It's cool. The ends justify the means. Yeah, exactly. And that seems like so often what we find in these dirty cops cases. All the time. So winning this case and being promoted after that seemed to make Lou more brave and confident to pursue more and more shady activities. Lou's cousin Frank Santora introduced Lou and Steve to mobster Bert Kaplan. In 1986, Bert Kaplan thought that he had been ripped off by a jeweler named Israel Greenwald. So he asked Lou and Steve to take him out in exchange for 30 grand. They followed Israel's car on the freeway. They turned on the sirens and they pulled him over. And this would turn out to often be their MO. They told Israel that he was a suspect in a hit and run and that they needed to take him down to the precinct and do a lineup and question him. Instead, they drove him to an auto repair shop in Brooklyn where they shot him and they buried him underneath the floor of the auto shop. These guys are just getting away with wild shit, to be honest, because that's, you know, pull them out on the freeway. Like I said, that was their MO. They would constantly just find out who the enemy was, who their target was, who the hit was on, and then pull them over. Normal. Yeah, you're going to stop. Nobody thought anything of it if, no. and would walk right, right by. Probably no one would look at them and think about, oh, I need to remember a description of these people. Yeah, no. If they were in pra- plain clothes, then it means, oh, I got to pay attention. There's something wrong going on. If they're cops, you're not going to be able to identify them. You're not yeah. going to think, oh, I should write the, the number down on the car. Nothing. So that turned out to be how they got most people, really. In 1986, Lucchese family underboss Anthony Gaspipe Casso had been the target of a murder hit. But although he was shot, he was actually able to duck into a Chinese restaurant and he survived the attack. After the ordeal, his friend, Bert Kaplan from the auto shop hit, suggested that he contact Lou and Steven to help him find the person that tried to kill him. So he was looking for revenge. And Burt Kaplan comes in and he's like, I've got these guys, they're cops, they'll find the people that did it, and they'll help you out. They've got like a consulting business on the side. Exactly. Consultants for the mob. So they hired him to, you know, find the information. They're the best, of course they hired him, their Yelp reviews are sky high. (laughs) Of course they hired him. The mob Yelp. Of course. It's called Melp. (laughs) So the pair gathered confidential police information, and a few days later, they turned over a manila envelope with all the police reports, all the information, photos, and addresses for everybody. Over the next few months, Anthony would single out individuals from that list of suspects and go after them one by one. He was determined to find the people that had tried to kill him and take them all out. That's scary. Yeah. And he's using cops to help him. Scarier. Like I just envision there's like a list on the fridge. No, really. With names and he just crosses them out one by one. That's truly what happened. It's yeah. terrifying. So yeah, all the whole list with the police reports, like even if there was suspicion, like, oh, we heard on the street that this happened or this person said this, a lot of it's hearsay. Write their name on the fridge. I mean, really, yeah. there's no forensics backing this up. They just brought... Anthony Casso the entire file of every name so this could be anyone that was involved to anyone that just possibly someone had a grudge and said something shitty about them yeah but he went after them all just one by one one of the suspects was named James Heidel so Anthony asked Lou and Steve to bring James to him in October they tracked down Jimmy and they brought him to a garage in Brooklyn When they got there, they attacked him immediately, they hogtied him, and they put him in the trunk so that Anthony Casso could take him to a nearby location and basically torture him for information. While he was torturing him, he started asking him a bunch of questions. He was trying to get whatever info he could about the hit on him and the attempt on his life. 
Eventually, Anthony killed James and James Heidel's body was never found. It's still one of those open mysteries. There's so many of those. Especially in this era. Oh, yeah. Just open files and missing people. A short time later, Anthony asked Lou and Steve to contact the next person on the suspect list. A Gambino associate named Nicholas Nicky Guido. So they went back to the precinct. They looked up in their databases all the information about Nicky Guido. They located Nicholas Guido's address and assassins followed him on the way to his uncle's house for Christmas. And Nicholas Guido was murdered on December 25th, 1986, en route to his uncle's house. The thing was, they had targeted the wrong Nicholas Guido. The actual murder victim was a 26-year-old that just had the wrong name. So sad. Yeah. I mean, uh, what? Yeah, Nicholas was just this young guy that he wanted to be a firefighter. He was on his way to his uncle's house, like I said, to show off this brand new car that he got for Christmas. He was just minding his own business and he had the wrong name and they killed him. It's crazy. I would think that you would be able to narrow it down by date of birth. This kid is 26 years old. They're looking for a mobster that's like in their 30s or 40s, I would think. That's a good point. If I remember correctly, they said like, oh, yeah, he was way younger than the person that we were looking for. It was just so far off base. Because I was just sitting here and I'm just thinking like, I know it was, you know, before you can Google someone, right? But <laughs> how do 30 you... 30 seconds, I'll find you thousands of Nikki Guidos. <laughs> there you go. But like, how do you narrow it down in these times, right? Like the olden days or whatever. But I guess date of birth, the age, right? You can probably, do they have access to like DMV photos at the time? Yeah, I guess I think by so. fax, you can get them by fax. But then I guess they don't really track like computer logins at that time. So you can be looking through files. Okay. So this is all making sense. So they didn't do their homework is what we're putting together here yes. at all. They just were like, oh, here's probably a list of five point at the first one. Let's go. Yeah, I think that it Who's was closest? just a cursory search. And yeah. that was like, okay, Nikki Guido, he lives in the same neighborhood. That's it. Yeah. It really was a terrible mix up. And if you know anything about this area at this time, I'm I'm sure it hasn't changed. Everyone, they're, how, what are their names? Nicholas, Joseph, Paul. Right. Richard. It's an extremely common name. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Juniors, the thirds, seconds, all of it, you right. know? So... It's, there's probably seven Nikki Guidos in that family. Way more. Yeah, in that neighborhood for sure. <laughs> yeah. Maybe they needed to do a little more homework on that one. I mean, it's just heartbreaking. They'd done a really good job up till this point. Right. But this is a huge, huge mix up. Big mistake. And huge. one of the things that I heard was that they had paid them for information, but basically Anthony Casso had shorted them some money and so he gave them like an incomplete list i'm not exactly positive about what specifically transpired but i think that anthony casso probably acted too soon on information like they gave them a list of maybe 10 nikki guidos and he thought this was the right one they were like okay this is the first search maybe they did get like you said some dmv photos let me know which one you recognize and he just pick the wrong one or something like that. From my understanding, half Lou and Steve's fault and half Anthony's fault because he didn't want to pay for them to get Got it. completely narrowed down list. Okay. But at the same time, don't turn over all that information about innocent civilians to a mob boss that's trying to murder someone. I mean, it's, well, I don't know. I don't think that's I would the say it's common sense, but it's like they don't care. No. Yeah, no. Yeah. I'm like, wait a minute, no. So I know there was some, like, it wasn't straightforward, just this is the Nikki Guido. I think there was some confusion amongst the two of them and a little bit of infighting that made them act on this information. And Anthony just pulled the trigger too soon on this. Gotcha. So I don't know. But it's really heartbreaking that this kid was just on Christmas Day showing off his new car and 
got yeah, killed. Yeah, that is a bummer. It, it is definitely a big, huge mistake. And it ended up, much later on, being one of the reasons that they uh, got taken down, as we'll see later. So pretty soon after this, in the fall of 1987... Lou proposed that he and Caracapa be on retainer for the Lucchese family. And I think that this was partially as a result of the accident with Nikki. He was like, you need to pay us for the information and we'll get it right. We shouldn't have a mix up like this. Yeah. Like insurance. Exactly. He was like, just put us on retainer. You can, it doesn't matter if you have 10 things that you need information on or one, just get us on your team. And then you'll know that we're working for you and we can get you the right info. So for a fee of $4,000 a month, they agreed to give Bert Kaplan and Anthony Casso any information they could get on every single family, any information about informants, ongoing investigations, wiretaps, imminent arrests, anything. And 4K back then would mean about $9,000 today. So between Steve and Lou, they're each getting, you know, four, four and a half grand, if you think about it today. Doesn't seem like enough. We to me. say that every single time because it's just like, I mean, it really is the equivalent of just selling your soul. Yeah, you know, you know yeah. These are murders we're talking about. And it's funny because then I think, well, what would it take for me? Right? <laughs> like, what would I sell my soul for? And that's and I'm the sure question I try not less, to think about. I'm sure it's much less <laughs> than I think it would be, right? Like, oh, it's too... Uh, I'm sure I'd talk shit about myself if I was reading this on a piece of paper. Like, this bitch, can you believe it? But I don't know. It just doesn't seem like enough. Yeah, I feel like every number we've ever seen in one of, one of these murder cases, it's never enough. It's Charles Becker, the first dirty cop that we did. He was like already a cop. He was on the on the payroll and everything. And then he was getting an extra 10K, which was like 28 or something back mm, then. Yes. And, it was tw- and I remember saying that t- totally. I would take this job. Yeah. If I'm already there, I'm already corrupt. I'll take this extra 30K a month. You know, now even if it's like 25. <laughs> well, I'm already a cop. Right. And I'm already corrupt as fuck. So here we go. This does not seem like enough, especially yeah. when it's mob related. It's such a small amount of money. Yeah. Especially, I mean, when we're talking about the Charles Becker case, and uh, I really hate to put things on a spectrum of like what's worse, but they really didn't seem to be carrying out a lot of murders. For this job, it's 4K a month, and you know people are getting People are dying. So it's it's the difference between Charles Becker, like, okay, you're getting paid off, but it's gambling. Yeah. It's people that are going to be in the underbelly. They're just going to do their thing, gambling whatever it's totally worth it It (laughs) it's totally worth it i'm just saying charles it's a little different but 28k for gambling is a big difference to four thousand for murders you can double that real quick (laughs) i'm just saying like this could happen yeah it's just i don't know this this amount of money is crazy small and like we said with becker they're still collecting their their wages for being on the NYPD and they're also taking contracts. So if they murder someone, they're getting 30 grand. So this is just for information, the 4K. So if they end up picking up a job where there's a hit to do, then there's another 30 in their pocket. And I've heard that some of the hits they did were up to 65K. Wow. They're still, they're bringing in a ton of money, especially if they carry out the murders themselves. It's crazy. So the Lucchesi's agreed and under the condition that Lou and Steve could not do any other work for any other families. So maybe they lost a couple jobs working for, let's say, the Gambinos or the Bananos or anything like that, but they had steady work. Every month they knew that they were going to get that money. Around this time, Stephen started working in the organized crime homicide unit which, of course, gave him much more access to not only NYPD mob investigations, but also FBI. So this was an incredibly good investment for the Lucchese's because now they had federal information, not just local cops, 
but any information about investigations that were open. This is a gold mine. So crazy the kind of info they were getting. So, of course, for the next few years, the NYPD saw a huge increase in murders of their informants and a ton of obstruction of their investigations. All of a sudden, their wiretaps are disappearing. They're, anyone that cooperated would all of a sudden just disappear or be murdered. So clearly, there was a leak. They knew there was a leak, but they could not figure out who it was. Imagine if you're like a good cop. Right. And you're just sitting and you're just getting news of all these people. Just check them off a list, you know, of informants and CIs and stuff like that. And they're just one by one. And, you know, somebody in this building is corrupt, is giving this information. There's no other way. People that aren't related to each other in cases separate or going missing, dying, you know, ending up in a river. I mean, that would be amazing. Not in a good way. But just, you know, kind of like a mind blowing where you're just, oh, my God, like it's it's one of us right here on this floor kind of thing. It was a crazy mind trip. I'm sure that they were extremely paranoid. I'm sure that they tried to take measures to the keep things more secretive of your coworkers yeah. and just everyone, you know. But you're in your cubicle looking over your shoulder oh, just yeah. like, do you think it's that guy? Oh, I don't know. That guy eats tuna for lunch. He's definitely fucked up. You yeah, know? Like, yeah, it's definitely. You're him. probably thinking some crazy shit and drawing crazy parallels like, oh, well, that guy looked at me funny. So he's the one. He's the leak, you know. And how many times maybe did their, you know, have fights in the squad room? Maybe yeah. I'm thinking or people that refused to work together because they were suspicious. I don't know. But it was a nutty time because nobody was safe. Oh, yeah. No. They couldn't yes, get no. anyone to cooperate. And as a cop and being out on the streets or, you know, trying to research these cases and going up to get an informant and knowing that person could disappear, knowing that you're putting their life in jeopardy. Yeah. I wonder how many people it took, like at what point, like two people die, five people die, 12, 30. How many of these people had to die before someone's just like, oh, my God, it's all. This is all people related to or, you know, that kind of it's like clear there's a leak for. Or how many people had to die before you became hesitant to even get an informant? Like, let's solve this another way because my informant is going to die. There's no way it'll make it. We can't rely on informants right now. So. Wow. It's completely insane. In October 1987, Lou and Steve told Anthony Casso that a Lucchese family associate named John Otto Heidel had turned informant. They actually provided the physical tapes that proved he was recording people and turning them over to authorities. So John Heidel was murdered. Apparently he was wearing a wiretap and I I don't know, like, if I knew that all these informants were disappearing... I would get maybe a safe deposit box or something, not keep them in my house. I feel like there was just more security measures that this guy could have taken to hide the tapes. Because apparently it was just, they pointed out, like, he hides the tapes in his bedroom or wherever. And that was proof that he was turning over information. Might have just been this person that just never thinks anything bad's going to happen to him, even though they're in the middle of this like criminal enterprise and all this going on. Well, it won't happen to me. Da, 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 and I continue my life with, like Austin Powers music playing in the background <laughs> of their brain. The, I always describe that's like what I hear, like do, 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 constant, <laughs> right. right? Just, the, you know, da, 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 whatever, living their life. My tapes, they're at home. It's fine. Yeah. Or probably- they're, oh, they're in the house somewhere. To be in the mob, you probably have to have a little bit of feeling of invincibility. Oh, so maybe I, I believe so. Yeah. But it just seemed very strange to me that you would have these wiretap tapes that you keep in your house. I'm with you. I, I don't understand that 100 percent. But you also can't trust anyone but yourself. So, well, you're right. you know, you can't trust banks. Co- I mean, it's pretty there's a lot of things you can't trust when you're in the mob, you know. But so man, the only person you depend on is yourself. <laughs> It just seems like I'd be terrified. I'd Me have too. To, I mean, I'd have to like murder Mountain. I'd put him in a box and bury him or something. Yes. And I'd dig it up every couple of days and put my new tapes in or something. That, by the way, that's true. How much money is in those hills? Yeah. Up there. 
That was one of the first things I thought when I saw that. I was like, that kid's right. We got to go up there with the metal detector. We're planning our daughter party expedition. <laughs> I it's can't coming. wait. I can't wait. In February, another informant named Anthony Delapi figured that Anthony Casso was onto him and suddenly disappeared. So most of the informants that weren't murdered, they would just flee. They would get wind that someone was trying to come after them and they would disappear. She's like the wind. <laughs> just like all these people just gone. Exactly. Ton I mean, just exodus of people. If they weren't murdered, they were just gone. And as an NYPD detective, when someone disappears, you don't necessarily know if they are in the bottom of the ocean or if they are just in California. Yeah. You really don't know. So Anthony Delapi, he just completely fled and they couldn't find him for a long while. So, of course, they turned to Stephen and Lou. Stephen contacted Anthony Delapi's parole officer and said that he needed to speak to him about an ongoing investigation. And of course, instead of questioning him, Anthony Delapi was murdered. In August 1990, Lou got word that there was a bunch of arrests that were about to happen. But it seemed strange that one person named Bruno Fasciolo was the only person without a pending arrest warrant. Of course, making Lou think that Bruno had flipped and given the info leading to those arrests. Right? I feel like that's kind of a logical conclusion. If he's the only one escaping... I've definitely seen this on The Sopranos, I think. So he's drawing that conclusion that Bruno is the one that ratted. Yeah, I'm going to think that that's probably the way it goes. So Lou and Steve lured Bruno to a garage and they stabbed him and shot him to death. Garage. Again, don't go Flashing to lights, garage, garage with a cop. No. Never, ever. And also, it seems, I don't know, the stabbing plus shooting, it just seems unnecessary. Just make it quick. I mean, I think that that's just fucking cruel. Yeah. Which, of course, you wouldn't expect anything different from murderers like this. But I'm overkill. still like, it's it is overkill. overkill, especially since you don't have a personal connection to these people. No. You see overkill in very emotional cases. You see overkill where you know that this person really well. But yeah. this is a random person that flipped. So it seems pretty evil. It's awful. Once Bruno was dead, they actually stuffed a dead canary in his mouth as a message to other mobsters that Bruno, you know, quote, sang like a canary. In other words, he was a rat. Bruno was found a few days later in the trunk of a car in Brooklyn. And I read there was one article that said that Bruno was actually later proved innocent, that the court documents didn't have him on the arrest warrant list, but he hadn't flipped at all. So I only found that in one place, but it's worth noting that it so, may have been another completely accidental kill. Yeah, or it's some other vendetta. And not to say, like, I would never use the word, like, justified. It's not like the other people deserved or anything like this. But for someone that's completely innocent, that's caught in the crossfire, maybe not completely in innocent, you know. There's Probably no one is innocent in this. Oh, my God. But, but at the same time, he was killed for something he didn't do. Yeah. That's all. Oh, yeah. So. He didn't deserve this one. This was the overkill was definitely fucked up. Yeah, definitely. The canary, the whole thing may have not even been true. In 1990, Lucchese boss Anthony Casso asked Lou and Steve to kill Gambino captain Eddie Lino as retaliation for the murder of Paul Castellano that was arranged by John Gotti. Did everyone follow that? So John Gotti asked for Paul Castellano to be murdered, and now Anthony Casso wants Eddie Lino murdered in retaliation. Got it. Cool. Thank you for Some thank of you, the though. mob stuff, it, I don't hard. know if I'm just slow or I would have to read each thing, especially when you're looking at case law and actual legal documents. I'm reading that shit four or five times. Like, wait, did I catch that right? All the names that are the same, like you said, 
This is it's where my clipboard and the whiteboard come in. All your post-its my and your books. My flow charts and my like, okay, this person is this person's uncle's cousin's, you know, wife. Like, okay, I got it now. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. So I don't, I definitely don't mean to talk like. No, it was a like, great. Oh, you didn't follow no, that. I needed that. I'm only saying it because I don't follow sometimes. I've read it and I was still like, uh, wait, huh? <laughs> I know what you're saying. I still can't. So yeah, Anthony Lino was definitely retaliation for the death of Paul Castellano. Oh, right. Okay. There you go. <laughs> On November 6, 1990, Lou and Steven pulled Eddie Lino over in his brand new Mercedes. Again, this is their MO, the pulling over. When they walked up to the window, instead of just asking for his license and registration, they started to kind of distract him with conversation. And from what I understand, Eppolito pointed over to the ground in the car and said, hey, what's that over there? And Caracappa shot Eddie Lino. They aren't even taking times. him anywhere anymore. They're just no. like capping people on the freaking in the street streets. sideways. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sideway. In, Highway. Yeah. In a cop car. Uh-huh. On the side of the road, just shooting someone nine times. Hey, what's that over there? Bang, bang. Yeah. They've it's done it enough times unreal. now that it's just comfortable and they're getting away with it. Yeah. So this is why the point where now? people just get completely brave. They're like, we haven't been caught. We've already committed X amount of murders. Fuck it. I will shoot him in the street. Yeah. That's crazy. It is. In 1990, Louis began trying to get work as an actor. Reportedly, from what I understand, after meeting Joe Pesci in a restaurant. I read that too. <laughs> and I think that he probably thought, hey, this guy is kind of like a gregarious Italian I'm that guy too. People like me. I can be an actor. Absolutely. And totally ego based. Just I need attention and love and I could do this. People like him, people like me. I'm good. I got this. Louis Eppolito repeatedly seeks the spotlight. Over and over again. Over and over. Whether it's like the entertainment industry, books, you know, interviews, television, anywhere he can. The more and more his career goes on, this is the point where he starts seeking the, the spotlight. And for someone who has committed all these murders and these crimes and stuff, like you really, you generally see people that are real killers are living pretty low key. Yes. This guy is just out there. I mean, it's interesting to me. No, I know. Yeah. I think that once you do something this awful, you would think that the logical conclusion is, let me hide away. Let me be as quiet as possible. Golden State Killer is a great example. Yeah. No drawing suspicion to myself. None. And he's just, a cop. He's a former cop. I yeah, mean, just fade the example. into obscurity. You're, that's it. Yes, that's it. But not Louis. Louis did not know how to do that. He needed everyone's attention, everyone's adoration, all the love in the world. It wasn't enough for him. And so he just had to get into the entertainment industry and get his face out there because everyone's got to love Louis, right? So after starting his acting career, no formal training, no nothing, just banging on his personality and winning face. Formal training. <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, like actors, I know, it's not I know. like he was going to Groundlings, like, let me get my improv skills up, you know? He so the just, actor's studio, like right. the doorman to pay for classes. <laughs> no, this fool was just like, look at me. I'm Italian. Here we go. Give me a job. So he did get cast, which is the weird thing. It's the charisma when you see it's overwhelming. Like he just has this, you know, gregariousness of like this yeah. Italian guy. Hey, the mobster, you know, gabagool, like all that <laughs> stuff to him. He has that like quality, kind of like Tony Soprano. Where he, like he seems like he could be really hard, but you also want to hug him. Yeah. It's like that perfect kind of that typecast role. Almost yeah. like he is that guy. He was very soft spoken. He was kind of like a teddy bear by this point. He was a little bit older, a little bit more chubby. And people were just like, oh, he's this this dad figure, this Italian dad. Like this guy will make you a good meal and was take like a care Paul of people. Sorvino too. Like that same kind of role guy. Yeah, it worked out well for him. Like I said, he got cast in a bunch of things just based off of his personality pretty much. He had small roles in movies like Lost Highway, Predator 2, Goodfellas, and Bullets Over Broadway. So he got some good work. In 1992, Louis wrote a book titled Mafia Cop, the story of an honest cop 
whose family was in the mob. When I saw, the first time I saw the title of this book, I just started laughing because I'm just like, uh, what the fuck are you talking about? He's ridiculous. An honest cop? I mean, okay, sure, sort of like a mafia family, like adjacent, mafia adjacent family, right? But you were never an honest cop. You were happened to be at the gym because you didn't have anything going on. You right. took a test. And that's the only reason you became a cop. And from day one, you were doing the wrong thing. And I always say this about so many things. If you have to proclaim something, it doesn't apply to you. If you're out there saying, I'm so honest, I'm blah, blah, blah. I, you aren't honest, period. And you know what's do you ever funny? Watch, um, oh. I know you like trash TV like I yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give it to me. But I don't know if you like UK trash TV. There's this thing called Love Island. I've heard of it. I've never seen it, but I've <laughs> heard of it and I've just girl, seen the chaos around it. Georgia, who's just like, I'm loyal, babe, I'm loyal. Oh, I'm God. loyal over and over again. And, you know, just you, cheating. of course, know what kind of behavior comes along with that. So, yeah, it's like that. If he's sitting there, the title of his book is Honest Cop. That's the first guy you should look into. Nobody that's an honest cop needs to proclaim from the rooftops that they're an honest cop. They just live by it and you know it's true. It's funny too because I always think like there's an editor or something behind him. Usually people, a lot of people don't name their own books. The titles right. come from someone else. I feel like this guy named his own fucking book. Yes. There's a difference between a ghost writer and like someone yeah. that helps you write a book and someone that's titling your book. He thinks this that is much Lou about Epolito's himself. Title. He thinks that much about himself that he titled this book for Definitely. sure. Definitely. That. Guaranteed. While Lou was promoting the book, claiming he was an honest cop, he was still carrying out hits for the mob. Even though he had income from this book, he's doing a whole press tour, the whole thing. Yeah, he doesn't need to do this. He doesn't need to do it. He's doing it because he fucking loves it and he's a goddamn murderer. That's like, <laughs> really what it is. I mean, God, he's so... Uh, That's a good if point. If I could just punch this guy, I really He didn't need to do this it. anymore. Yeah, it's just... No. It really is something that he loves Lifestyle. Doing. It is. He loves it. So, I mean, the book sold okay, I guess. I didn't even look up the statistics, like the the sales on the books. I should have looked that. But still, we know that he was doing a whole press tour for it. I mean, there was a lot of people that he became well known. He was on Sally Dresser Raphael on the book tour. Yes. So it was it did decent because he did do a national book tour. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then back home, of course, he's well known now for being the book guy. Like yeah. he's got all the adoration and he's still not murder. enough, though. No, nope, never enough. So Big Frank Lasterino asked Lou and Stephen to murder Lucchese made man Patrick Testa in 1992. Big Frank had recently been promoted to consigliere after carrying out a hit based off of confidential information supplied, of course, by Lou and Stephen. After being promoted to consigliere, Frank wanted to make a power move to carry out a hit on one of his own men. And this was, of course, in order to incite a war between his family, the Lucchesis, and his rivals, the Gambino family. So the goal of this hit was, if they think the Gambinos did it, then now the Lucchesis and Gambinos are at war. Gotcha. So Lou and Steven carried out the hit on Patrick Testa and made it look like the Gambinos did it, like Big Frank asked. And I honestly don't know the details of how they made it look like the Gambinos did it, but maybe it was just like a logical conclusion. I don't know. Uh, yeah, maybe. Like if he's a Lucchese, it must have been a Gambino kind right? of thing. Right. Or knows? like he had a canary in his mouth or something, right? right? Something, and that's the signature, signature. of so-and-so. Of course, this murder went over without any heat on Lou and Stephen. So they carried on with their lives. From the book fame, Lou got more roles in movies and began to write screenplays and toured the talk show and press circuit. Like you said before, he was on Sally Jesse Raphael and he talked about coming from mob family, being a good cop, the whole thing. Eventually... Both Lou and Steven left the NYPD because the mob crackdown and the heat on all mob activity ramped up in the 90s. It was such a huge problem in the 80s that then there was this swing in the pendulum where NYPD was very focused on the mob. 
In the they 90s. got out just in time. Like they're lucky, to be honest, that they had this information that, like, oh, they're going to crack down on the mob. Let's bounce. Exactly. Now they were on the inside, and they could tell. Oh wait, bad things are coming. Yeah. There's a storm that's headed towards all the mob families. Yeah. Let's get out. Because Lou wanted to be closer to Hollywood, he moved his family to a gated community in Las Vegas in 1994. Lou sold cars at an Infinity dealership, and reportedly he liked to entertain his co-workers by showing them crime scene photos from his old NYPD days. I feel like this is the perfect thing for Lou to be like a used car salesman, basically. Totally. Like in Las Vegas, too, because you know there's... All these guys in Vegas that are mob, right? Mm -hmm. Binions and all this. They all hang out downtown. But then you go to places outside of the strip and you meet these characters that live in Vegas full time, right? And it's they're interesting folks. My dad lives there. <laughs> and uh, this guy, I've met this guy. He works everywhere. Yes. And I just, as soon as I read this, I'm like, he's living in Vegas, a car dealership. This is perfect for him. Telling his mob stories, showing pictures of dead people. I mean, that's the perfect job. Honestly, yeah. Probably sells a ton of cars. Yes. He's, of course, extremely charming. There's nothing to make you think there's anything wrong with this guy. I mean, really. And he can lean on, oh, I was a former cop angle. Or he can be like, yeah, I was in the mob angle to try to sell cars. Like this guy's, I mean, I'm sure it was a wonderful thing to listen to them talk all day at yes. the car dealership. You're the one that always likes to use the phrase silver tongue. Yes, this that's This is it. Lou Epolito. That's how I feel. Silver yeah. tongue. Silver tongue is Lou. Yeah. So a car dealer, definitely the perfect job. Oh, yeah. For sure. A year later, Stephen bought a house directly across the street from Lou's family. These two. They're attached at the hip. Yeah. This is it's like a, crazy. The, an 80s sitcom like based on these guys or something. Totally. You know what I mean? Like former retired NYPD cops living across the street from each other. Mayhem ensues. Yes. Right? It's like, like full like house. Grumpier old men with murder, you yeah, know? There you go. <laughs> Though they claim to have retired... It was, of course, later proven that while they were in Vegas, Lou and Steven continued to deal drugs, take jobs, and take contracts. From what I understand, they sold meth, ecstasy, and weed. They're in a great location, too, to do that for them. Because Vegas is kind of the Atlantic City, you know, the West Coast, so everybody goes there. Vegas is a great location for anything. No Vegas, matter what you want, yeah. I guarantee you it's in Vegas. It's one of the reasons that I've thought about moving to Vegas so much. There's everything there. And those people that are like Lou that are kind of crazy, I kind of like them. Other than Lou. I don't like murderers. But you know what I mean? I like those kind of trash people. You don't need bit. that in your life? <laughs> Like, you don't need to introduce that Vegas lifestyle. I like weird Just Vegas. because you think it's fun. We can go visit <laughs> all the time. I know. That's why I haven't all moved the time. yet. Because I just no, go no, no, over don't there move. Don't do this. Don't do this. We'll visit. And let's, we'll let our freak flags fly. We're going to look stuff up. I want everyone to contact me with, like, things to do in Vegas that are like, what? I do right? so. I, I do way too much in Vegas. I love Vegas. I just like the weird shit. How long do we need? A couple days? Oh, man, I could oh I could God. spend a while there. Oh, wow. I'm telling you. The last time I was there, I was looking at apartments. I, I shit you not. Don't make that face at me. Don't judge Sorry, me, monkey. let me fix my face. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just, you know, my dad, my brother, sister, stepmom, they I all know. live out there. There's just so it's a like... different element. It's people are weird in Vegas. Yes. But I like weird. I just enjoy it. I like their downtown scene. They've got a punk scene you now. You know what? You do. I like the arts districts. You love they fringe. Have, they have punk rock bowling every yeah. year. It's my favorite. I mean, yeah. They have it here. We'll find it. They have a pinball hall of fame. Okay. Anyway, we can move on. <laughs> circus Sorry. Circus is like the heart. Oh, man. That beats of the I weird. I love me some Circus Circus. So I weird. love Circus Circus at like three in the morning and there's kids. Yeah. Up. Like, what are you doing at three in the morning Take your in parents a cloud home. of smoke? Yeah. No kidding. That what are you guys point. doing? Great point. That's my favorite thing the about buffet circus, at the circus. Rio. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> so definitely this was the right place for Lou and Steven because there is that fringe element because there is that car dealer kind of yeah. silver tongue thing that people just exist there because they have that. They have that low level it factor. Yeah. Not enough to be a celebrity, but enough to be on Sally Jesse Raphael. Definitely. That's all I'm saying. I love that. <laughs> So, of course, like I said, they said they were retired, but 
they were still taking jobs on the side in their free time from dealing cards. <laughs> so a couple of the big name things that they did while they were in Vegas is they conspired to kill John Jr. Gotti and Salvatore Sammy the Bull Gravano. But I think they were losing their edge because both of those plots failed. I don't know how they could carry out hits on such big people without spending a lot of time in New York, right? They're too far away. Well, it's also like a real big jump from the people that they've been knocking off and then to go to, you know, yeah, some royalty of the mob. Yeah, those are some big names. So I yeah. I think that it's like, I, I don't know how much they energy they off. put into that. I think they bit off a lot too. Probably went, oh, this is a lot of work. That's, you're probably onto something yeah. there. I think that was too big of a job for them. Louis and Stephen thought that they were in the clear, of course, being years have passed and they're now in Vegas. But in 1993, the main mafia boss that they have worked for, Anthony Gaspipe Casso, was arrested and he turned informant to avoid life in prison. If you remember correctly, he's the one that had all these people killed after they came after him. All these people that he thought were rats, he was the guy. And now all of a sudden, he turned rat. He's got a lot to say. That happens every time. It's so crazy. Again, if you have to shout something from the rooftops, if you have to murder people to prove that you're loyal, then you're probably going to flip. Right? He's Jose and loyal. <laughs> it's true. He's just, yeah, too much. You're too loud about it and... If you're trying to take out all the rats, you definitely know you're going to turn informant. So Anthony revealed that he'd been paying Lou $4,000 a month for confidential information about law enforcement and other mob families. He also told the FBI about Lou and Steve's involvement in extortion rackets, robberies, murders, the whole thing. But the problem was, Anthony Casso's stories changed constantly, and he wasn't a credible enough witness, so Lou and Steve were not arrested. When you see footage of Anthony Casso talking, he doesn't even really get Stephen Caracappa's name right. He's like, it's a C, it's a long name, it's Car yeah. something, blah, blah, blah. I mean, he seemed to be a little bit all over the place, and maybe he was attempting to take so many people down with him that his stories just got all convoluted and it didn't work out. So nothing really came of that. Even though it was a scary, he's flipping kind of situation, they didn't press charges. A short time later in 1994, a story broke in the Daily News that Lou and Steve were involved in Gambino family member Eddie Lino's murder. Again, he was the one that was shot nine times in the Mercedes in the middle of the street. So, Lou came back to New York to make himself available to NYPD for questioning. But he was never charged, so he went back to Vegas. I'm pretty sure that him just coming to New York made him look innocent, and they looked at his record and were like, oh, he's in the clear. Because it seemed like there was nothing to it. They just let him go. Yeah, and I think also they're in the middle of doing serious mob trials and stuff at this point. In, yeah. at, at this in history in New York at this point, like 2000 or 2000, what is wrong <laughs> with me? 94 or whatever it is. So it, they've got a lot going on. And unless he comes in and just sings like a canary or spills his guts and tells everything there, he's not. He's just like, I wasn't involved. I can help if you want, but there's no help I can give you. Go home. See you. Thanks yeah, for coming. Maybe they did think, well, he'll say something right away. And when he didn't and he defended himself, they were like, well, we're not getting anything out of you. We've got bigger fish to fry. And, he's and they moved on. Retired and why Who bother? Knows? Or maybe there just wasn't enough evidence. Yeah. I don't know. But it seems strange to me that they had enough of a connection to know an actual person who would have been murdered by them, but they couldn't put it together. It's disappointing. Over the next few years, the FBI and local law enforcement built their case against Lewis and Stephen. Detective Tommy Dades compiled evidence, reviewed files, and interviewed witnesses. One of the witnesses that I thought was interesting was the mother of James Heidel, 
who had seen Lou and Steve the day of her son's disappearance. And what happened was she had seen the cops outside. And then when she saw Sally Jesse Raphael, she recognized Lou on the TV. And she was like, I think that's the cop that came to get my son. So she ran out and got Lou's book. And she opened up, looked at the pictures, and she recognized Stephen as the other cop came to get her son. You just go cold everywhere, right? <sighs> just everything inside of you. Just um, you get like the wah wahs, like you're gonna wah wah wah. You're just gonna pass out. I mean, yeah. just oh my god. And Karen Cap, when you see him, he's someone. I don't remember a lot. I say I have face blindness. <laughs> I can think of him and what he looks like right now. Very striking. Yeah. And you would, especially if, you know, the people that you saw last with your son who died, you've never seen again. You remember, you think back, what did he look like? And that's in your brain. Yeah. I can't. Oh, my God. And to hear her talk about it, it's basically like she knew a couple years before this detective was gathering information. And she was like, I don't even know who to go to. Maybe nobody cares about any of the mob activity. No one's going to believe me. That kind of stuff. And then once she maybe saw this Lino article or whatever it was, and the detective followed up on some of the leads, followed up with some of the witnesses, when they called the mother, she was like, I know who it is. She's like, not only can I give you information from back then, but I've put it together who those people were yeah. that I told you I saw many years ago. So it's all kind of coming together, even though they couldn't get them on the Lino thing they're still be building their case, you know? Yeah, and the more you start reading, you know, case files and police reports, I'm sure it comes up multiple times. A tall, lanky cop and a, sh you know, shorter, chubby cop. Were, I saw One of them. the witnesses they, had to be like, are you familiar with David yeah, Spade and Yeah, Chris for Farley? sure, right? Are you, have you seen Saturday Night Live? Um, <laughs> How do you feel about Black Sheep? Oh, Tommy boy, so good. anyone? All so think of so them, good. but cops. Yeah, yeah. Are you and with then me, like, officer? We know exactly the guys you're talking about. We'll we'll make a <laughs> phone call right now, ma'am. I think you know you read and and like these names start to come up more and more and more, and this is where they're kind of putting it together that oh, okay. Yes, once Maybe you hear the name attention. once or twice, yeah, eh, okay, he's got a clean record. Whatever, dismiss it. Think that someone was mistaken, but then if it's coming up in case after case. Now we need to look into evidence. It's always related to Lucchese. Like, you know, there's certain things that are always, you can just check them off a list. Yeah. That they happen every time and they're always mentioned. Right. In May 2004, Detective Dades went to the prison where their old Lucchese family contact, Bert Kaplan, was serving time. And Detective Dades attempted to get him to cooperate. And at first, Bert completely refused. Until Detective Dades brought up the innocent 26-year-old Nicholas Guido, who was accidentally killed. And I'm thinking, from what I understand, Bert was a little bit older, maybe had a son around Nikki's age, and it really hit home with him. Bert got really emotional once he brought Nikki up. And because of that, he agreed to cooperate. Over the course of several more interviews, Bert detailed all the things that Lou and Stephen had done for the Lucchese family. But before the NYPD could arrest them, the FBI swooped in and they said they wanted to attempt to make the case federal and catch them on current organized crime charges. I can understand. I mean, that makes sense if you're trying to take down the mob, especially, you know. Oh, if you can go back in time and lock this pretty bow on it. I mean, it makes total sense because you're like, let's make this a huge, let's send them away forever. Yeah. This has got to be a huge case. But for that detective that's been working on oh, this, God, it's right? got to be a kick in the pants. Like, oh. he's got to be pissed. But I'm sure he understood the overall, like, we're going to get him, just not today kind of thing. I hope so. We'll get him on something bigger. And that was hopefully enough for him. So what they did was they put a wire on a Vegas drug informant and they sent him to get Lou and Steven to sell them drugs. And they were busted on that was drug easy. charge. Like, Super okay. straightforward. Oh, okay. Yeah. Probably in the 
parking lot of the Infinity dealership. <laughs> right? It's like selling Molly to some freaking kids going EDC or something. Something. Yeah, it seemed like it was a slightly bigger deal than uh, just a a hand-to-hand. It was more like, from what I understand, there was, again, because Lou is thirsty as fuck, it was someone in the entertainment industry. Oh, God. And he was like, you know, I'm going to get you guys drugs. He was talking a big game, blah, blah, blah. I'm your guy. And I've also got this screenplay, blah, blah, blah. So it was someone that posed as a producer or something, someone that could help him in Hollywood. And so he did the deal. Was it Chris Angel? (laughs) It was Chris Angel, wasn't it? Because when I think Hollywood, I think Chris Angel. When I think Vegas, I think Chris Angel. (laughs) What are you talking about? That's who's buying drugs at the Infinity dealership. You know what? Allegedly. You are so right. I could totally imagine Chris Angel buying like meth that. at Infinity. Yep. Like that. Yeah. You know, it's funny because last time I was in Vegas was 2015 EDC. I stayed at the Orleans Hotel. They had it there. It's a lot. It just came to me. <laughs> Sorry. Keep going. So on March 9th, 2005, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracapa were arrested in Vegas for racketeering, obstruction of justice, extortion, and eight counts of conspiracy and eight counts of murder. The murders were of James Heidel, Nicholas Guido, John Otto Heidel, Patrick Testa, Anthony Delapi, Bruno Facciolo, Edward Lino, and Bartholomew Borriello. It's a lot of people. It's a lot. Again, these people are in uniform protecting our streets. <sighs> so they were extradited from Vegas to New York to stand trial. While out on bail, Stephen went on 60 minutes to proclaim his innocence and defend himself. I can't think of any other case where someone murdered eight people and they got bail. This is so fucking corrupt to me. I, I don't even have any like commentary on this because right. it's, it's like devastating. I have to think it's maybe an age thing. He's in his like early 60s, I, I believe. And he's, um, a, he's a former cop on and he's the a former PD. But I think that uh, here's the thing is he is way scarier behind the scenes to me than he is like up front, close and personal kind of thing. You know, he'll kill you for sure. You know, he's able to move things around, even if he's an old man. He, he can arrange your death is he's what I'm the trying to say. Yeah, he's a puppet master. And so he's scary to me out even if he's 80 years old. So what? I just don't think there's any good reason to let someone accused of eight murders that you have a ton of evidence on and a ton of witnesses To just go free on the street. We agree. And again, there's just so many cases where anyone that's in poverty or from a minority that do a very small minor crime that are given, you know, no bail or something crazy. You think they wanted to let him try to hang himself in the sense of like, let him out. He's going to go on 60 minutes. He's going to do all this. He's going to say some crazy shit because he just has to talk. Right. It's possible. It is possible. So I think that a lot. I think that a lot that, you know, like just give them the rope, they'll hang themselves. And I think that happens a lot. Yeah, that does make sense. Like, you know, that someone with this kind of ego, if he runs, we have a reason to pick him up and take him in. And these kind of connections, he'll make a mistake somewhere. Absolutely. He'll try and cover up. He'll talk to the wrong person, whoever, whatever it was. And maybe he'll talk to someone that we didn't even know was connected. Now we can take them. Something like that. Maybe he'll get scared, panic and run to the wrong person. Yeah. I don't know. This is all speculation. I feel better thinking about it in that way than Me thinking too. that it's just straight up injustice. You know, <laughs> like, I'm going to choose to believe that it's to try to, you know, let him fuck up. <sighs> That's a much more optimistic Let's way go to with think that. of it than I was thinking. Let's go with it. So I'm going to cling to it. Okay. So, of course, the trial started and Bert Kaplan was the star witness in the case. His testimony sounded credible, and he was able to recount lots of details. There were other witnesses, and of course some forensics, that backed up all of Bert's testimony. So all the things that were questionable about Anthony Casso being a good witness and giving good testimony, completely the opposite with Bert. Once they knew they had Bert, they knew that they could get this trial Bert was loyal. If he said he was going to do something, you know, he did it. Yeah. (laughs) I'm going to sing. Okay. And he did. 
Yeah, he always followed through. And like I said, everything backed up his statements. So on April 6, 2006, after only 10 hours of deliberation, Louis Eppolito and Stephen Caracappa were convicted on all charges and sentenced to life in prison. In July of 2010, their convictions were upheld by a Second Circuit appeals court. Both were sent to federal high-security prisons. Stephen died of cancer on April 8, 2017, and after they were convicted, the city spent $18.4 million dollars to settle lawsuits with the families of Lou and Stevens' victims. As they should? I mean... Yes, completely, 100%. Because at some point, you've got to assume they were turning a blind eye. There were points where they knew they had a rat and they couldn't find them, but there were other points where it's like, we know this guy was disciplined, you put him back on the streets. I feel like there were times where they could have... I don't know, held him accountable more. I think finding that rat probably wouldn't have been as hard as they kind of try to make it seem. Yeah, just give out some wrong information or something that's not as consequential as being a rat and someone getting murdered, but just some arbitrary wrong information. All that. See where it comes from, where it goes. And You and I sitting here, we just, okay, we came up with the plan. There it is. I don't know. I Not guess. everyone's as good of a detective as us. Clearly. Courtney. Every week we come up with something genius <laughs> that everyone else should be using in their life. And they're just not. And I just don't understand. We need to go to the NYPD and help them out. That's oh, all I'm saying. They need us. <laughs> they just don't know it yet. Um, so this is really the very when I think of dirty cop, this is the story. Yeah, these are dirty cops. This is like the quintessential dirty cop story. This is D for dirty cops. A hundred percent. Yeah, and I've forced my boyfriend the other day to watch Goodfellas with me just for the half of a second that this guy's in it. And though I'm watching this movie for two hours and 25 minutes, and I'm just like, where is he? Where is he? I mean, this is so fast that it's insane. But he is in Goodfellas. Yep. I mean, it. it's a trip to me. He's just out there living his life, just not laying low, not Golden State Killer at all. Not at all. Out there. Crazy. But there was no option for Lou. He could not fade into obscurity. It was not in his DNA. He no. had to be out there getting all the love and adoration and being this gregarious guy that everyone liked. You know? And it wasn't just entertainment industry need. It was he needed he was a womanizer. He needed exactly. attention from women. He, you know, probably got a lot of attention at work because he was promoted. And, you know, he he had this shining record until he didn't. But. He seemed to need attention from a lot of different angles. Yes. It wasn't just, you know, I want to be a star. (laughs) And then, of course, Stephen, on the other hand, is completely low key. There's not a lot of information about him, even just the basic biography backstory of his life. There's not much there because I think that's just the kind of person he was. I think he was just a quiet guy. I'm going to let Lou take the spotlight. I'm also going to collect half the money, but I'm the brains of this operation and I stay quiet. Yeah. He probably, Lou was stupid for just being out there on the TV and the movies, writing books. And he knew that. And he was like, I'm the one that lays low. Yeah. I'm not the one that's going to get us busted. Um, the other kind of funny, we've got, to th- I've got to throw it in there. I know you're a fan, but there's the Mob Wives connection, yes. which is, Karen Gravano is Sammy the Bull, who they were going to kill, but they bit off more than they could chew. And then Bruno Facciolo is Carla's uncle. Right. Carla's from Mob Wives. So it is kind of funny to know that, you know, some of these girls are like legit Mob Wives, right? Yes. Because when I would watch that show, there was the real Mob Girls and then there were the girls that were just Mob adjacent. It seemed like there was this kind of class divide oh, of absolutely. how much of a mobster you were. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I know, you know, Karen and Carla definitely had the clout, but I didn't realize that this was Carla's uncle. I knew she was, you know, it, she had family there, but I didn't realize it was this. And there's a brand new show yes. on MTV called Made in Staten Island. <gasps> yes. I've heard stars, of it. stars, you know, Sammy the Bulls granddaughter Karen from Mob Wives' daughter Karen's daughter yes Karen's daughter sorry I'm trying to like 
when it like I said, when it comes to mob stuff, I have to think like way too hard. about. I know. It. But when There's it's also like reality television mob stuff, we need to get it right. Yeah, I know. This right? is important. This is important. <laughs> They're still in the public eye. Oh, They're yeah. Still mob celebrities at this point. So Generations down. Yep. So interesting. Mob culture. It's really a big deal. And how intertwined the mob and the police, not in a cops and robbers situation, but in a mutual understanding relationship that they have. And you see it again and again. And I know, you know, oh, things have changed, you know, what? No, I there's a lot of things that are still the same. Yeah, I think things have changed. uh, But I think that there's a lot of things that we just don't know about. Or maybe that things are more quiet because they learned that they really didn't get too far being like Lou. This is true. So there's probably a lot of activity that's a little bit more covert. But I mean, still, it's just, it is what it is. I mean, mob mob crime is never going to go away. There's always going to be these families. It's just going to shapeshift. So. Okay. (sighs) That's D for dirty cops. It was dirty. It was so dirty. Yeah. So before we get out of here, we just wanted to say thank you once again to our new Patreon supporters, Heath, Laura, and Marsha, who increased our pledge. Thank you. So thanks again for your support on Patreon. If anyone wants to find our Patreon link, it's in the show notes. Or if you want to get merch on Threadless, that's in our show notes too. And I don't know if you want to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, that's in our show notes. One of my goals is to get to 10K followers on instagram have i talked to you about this i just want that little where it just says k oh the k of, yeah I, know. I want it i want it so bad i would love that so yeah that's one of those things that i just want to have that's fun it's very silly it no, doesn't good really one. mean anything it means nothing but, but it's it just something, would you make know? me so happy <laughs> whatever it's the little things we'll see you next week be nice be good to each other say something nice leave reviews five stars and say this is something nice to people and then we'll see you next week be safe yep see ya bye mysteriously listed is a podcast dedicated to people who are interested in true crime maybe you are interested in a topic but don't know if you want to commit to an hour-long podcast on just one particular case Mysteriously Listed will share with you the top 10 true crime stories and mysteries in each themed episode, which will give you a teaser on each case. If you are fascinated by true crime stories, unsolved mysteries, serial killers and mass murders, you will love Mysteriously Listed. Listen to Mysteriously Listed on iTunes or anywhere you listen to great podcasts. At Metro, the best deal in wireless is on. Switch to Metro and get one full Amazon Prime membership included every month. Plus, get two free phones from top brands like Samsung and LG with huge HD screens. All with two lines for just 90 bucks. That's the best deal in wireless, only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. Requires port and of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. Limit four per account or household. Offer subject to change. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Amazon Prime has a $12.99 per month value. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions. At Metro, the best deal in wireless is on. Switch to Metro and get one full Amazon Prime membership included every month. Plus, get two free phones from top brands like Samsung and LG with huge HD screens. All with two lines for just 90 bucks. That's the best deal in wireless, only at Metro. Plus sales tax and activation fee. Requires port and of eligible number not currently active on T-Mobile Network or active on Metro in past 90 days. Limit four per account or household. Offer subject to change. Offer valid for new Amazon Prime members. Amazon Prime has a $12.99 per month value. Restrictions apply. See store for details and terms and conditions.